brought to you from Melbourne, Australia. This is the Badminton Podcast, a community for badminton players by badminton players, where we talk badminton, celebrate local heroes, interview players from all walks of life, and push you to grow as a player and a person. Introducing your hosts, Jeff and Henry. Welcome to the Badminton Podcast. I'm Jeff. And I'm Henry. And we're the co-founders of Alantware, the world's most versatile badminton apparel. Thanks for joining us on the next episode of our podcast. If you want to find out more about what our podcast is about, why we started, and why we started our brand, Volantware, you can listen to our introductory episode or visit us at www.volantware.com. We're really excited to share with you our next guest today, and I'll let Henry do the honors in introducing someone really special. Yes, today we have someone super special. And for those of you in the badminton community around the world, you may have heard of her before. She goes by the name of Becky Ann Sess or Badminton Becky. And Becky is an American living and playing badminton in China. She was never much for sports, preferring the theater department and riders retreats to sports games until four years ago when she picked up a badminton racket for the first time in her 40s. She started a blog chronicling her adventures of a middle-aged newbie in 2015 called Badminton Becky and last year started a YouTube channel with the same name. She's gotten the opportunity to meet badminton legends like Lee Chong Wei and interview top players such as Tai Tzu Ying, The Minions, Ratchanok Intanon and more. Her change from a bookworm too cool for sports to a badminton obsessed jock has surprised even her. It's pretty easy to be ignored. You have to push. You kind of have to push your way in. Force yourself to be very outgoing and don't feel bad about being pushy and trying to play with people. Just keep doing it. That's the biggest lesson I've learned about myself. If I just stick to it, if I really want it, I can do it. Thanks so much for coming onto the podcast, Becky. Thanks for having me. And thanks for saying I'm a special guest. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All of our guests are special. Incredibly special guests. <laughs> we have to make you feel special, Becky. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do. Good, so this good, is good. a this is a really interesting story. And we're really excited to share with all the listeners about Becky's story because these are the stories that we want for our badminton community, to build our badminton community where we've got all levels of players doing awesome things with their lives. And I'm really excited. I think it's going to be really interesting. So just to kick us off, Becky, no pressure whatsoever to make this fun and exciting and interesting. (laughs) Okay. Okay. I will try to be as boring as possible. (laughs) But we'd love just to hear about what you're about, Becky. So what were you prior to badminton? What were you doing? And just a bit of a background so that all of our listeners can understand where you came from and see the transition to now. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know how far back to start, but uh, you're a pretty normal person, although um, I've always loved traveling. And I came to China in the year 2009, originally just for one year to teach English and have money to travel. I mean, I came here to make money so I could travel because I wanted to travel, but I had no money and teaching English is kind of an easy thing to do. And uh, one year turned to two and two turned to three and and so on until now, 10 years later, I'm still here. This is my 11th year and uh, I am not planning to leave anytime soon. (laughs) Oh, wow. And, And you were saying that, I mean, teaching English is easy, but for the fans that are playing at home, Becky is Caucasian. So how how was it speaking Chinese and, and teaching English? Oh, uh, well, actually, um, my students don't know that I can speak Chinese. <laughs> I, <laughs> okay. teach, I teach at a university. It's a public, like, government-run university. So my students are English majors, so they should be fluent. Like, I even teach, like, first-year students. They should be fluent, and and their goal is to be, you know, teachers, interpreters, translators in the future. So I actually decided, I mean, in the beginning, when I first came here, I couldn't speak any Chinese and it took me a really long time to learn. But even after I learned, I never, ever, I don't, they ask me, 
and I don't tell them if I can or not. <laughs> and <laughs> if they ever speak Chinese, um, sometimes it's really funny. I'll actually answer a question if they have a question and they say it in Chinese, like to their friend next to them, and I hear it, I'll actually answer it. But they assume that if I answer it in English, then they've said it in English. <laughs> so <laughs> they don't. I've answered their <laughs> questions in Chinese, and they don't even realize that I understood them speaking Chinese. So they have no idea. Some of them kind of figure it out because、uh, when I see a badminton friend, my badminton friends only speak Chinese. So sometimes the worlds have mixed and crossed. So some students are onto my secret, but very few. <laughs> Becky, that's a really funny story because I've got a good friend, and he's from Colombia, and he speaks Spanish and English. Yeah. And I would ask him something. I would send him, say, a voice message or something like that, and then he would respond to me in sp- in Spanish, and he just won't notice at all. And he doesn't notice. I,、yeah. He doesn't notice at all. And then I pull、yeah. him up, and he just starts laughing. He's, and he's oh, well, I'm speaking <laughs> Spanish right now.、Uh, and then he's done it so many times where he just starts speaking Spanish to me. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, they don't even notice. So it's a good trick. So I get your secrets they- out, Becky. Well, Once this podcast goes live. Oh yeah. Well, I don't know. Can they? Can can Chinese people access your website? And have、That's、you tried? <laughs> That's a very good question. So、they should be able to access.、Mm, they should be able to access some form of podcasting streaming service that would have us on it. I think. I don't、That's、know.、True. But like you know, Spotify, <laughs> Google, those are all blocked. So we'll see. We'll, we'll have to see. <laughs> we'll figure it、yeah. out. <laughs> yeah. We'll figure it out. Figure it out. Big audience here. Yeah.、Absolutely. So Becky. In the U.S.,、um, where are you ba- where were you from in the U.S. and where are you based now in China?、Um, I'm originally like near New York City. I grew up near New York City in Connecticut, and now I live in Xiamen, China, which is in the southeast coast. So I'm like directly across the strait from Taiwan, and I'm a little bit like north of Hong Kong. So very south, very hot and steamy down here, but. The best province in China for badminton. <laughs> That's where、oh, you want to be. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I want to be. Like Lin Dan was born not far from here. Chen Long is from here. We have like a ton of players here, so it's a great place for badminton. Have you managed to cross paths with some of the the popular badminton players or the superstars at all? Yeah,、um, Zhao Yunle. She lives here too, and she was at a badminton competition and just taking pictures. And、uh, her husband, her new husband Hong Wei, I think his name is.、Um, he also was at a competition, and、uh, Zhao Yunle's ex-husband, the men's doubles player, he's also from here. So I saw him play a game. In Shaman, because they have a in China, they have like the NBA of badminton, where the pro players have their own teams and they play like an NBA final game. So like Lin Dan, I think is the Qingdao team, so he plays for that team.、Um, our team, we have Chen Long, Shaman City, and a bunch of others. So I actually got to see one of those games, which was really cool. And there was a lot. It was a.、Uh, Olympic year, the year that I saw them, and a lot of them had like just won Olympic medals, so it was really, really cool. Yeah, that's super cool, and I, I really hope that we could bring something like that to Australia as well. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I mean, it's really like cool to have just kind of like a national league, you know, and that just plays、mm. games against each other. And in China, of course, like. They're Olympic medalists and stuff, so it's really, really cool to be so close and see them in like small gyms. I mean, not small, but they're not giant BWF stadiums. They're just kind of the local, like one of the gyms I played one of my competitions at. So they're not huge gyms or stadiums or whatever. So it's really cool to see them very close. Yeah, that sounds really yeah yeah amazing. It'd be yeah, like I said,、mm. like Henry said, it'd be cool to have that kind of infrastructure in. Australia, in the the states, and in other countries that where badminton isn't quite as developed as well. Totally. So, Becky, prior to you moving to China, what were you doing work wise? Um, I had like a ton of jobs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm one of those people like I never really cared about like a quote unquote career.、Um, I had my own company, a children's publishing. Company that we had a children's magazine and a couple books that we published.、Um, 
Right before I came to China, I was working for a small book publisher in New Hampshire. I was living in New Hampshire, America, and I was also working for TripAdvisor. You know the uh, internet yep. travel company. Mm -hmm. I was just doing that.、Uh, you can like work from home, so I was just trying to like make as much money as I could before I came to China, because I didn't know how much money we would need to live in China. So, you know, I've always had just random jobs to pay the rent, but no job I've never been super passionate about. Okay, and then when you decided to move to China to teach English, was there something that just Were you just saying to yourself, "I need something to change," or and you just、yeah. took, you put the bullet, or was there any significant event or something that happened that made you made that choice? No, I was just really tired of the same place. <laughs> <laughs> I am one of those people, like you know, wanderlust is in my DNA, and I lived in New Hampshire.、Um, I was married at the time.、Uh, I got divorced after coming to China, several years after, but.、Uh, Just I'm just bored of living in the same place for too long. Like more than like five or six years is too much for me. And we had lived in New Hampshire for ten years at that point, so I just wanted something fun, a change, some adventure. Yeah, that's really cool, Becky. And from our perspective now, just looking in, or anyone who reads your blogs, listens to your, or watches your YouTube channel, it would seem that your life now. Primarily revolves around badminton. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs>、um, so, congratulations, firstly, on your tenth year anniversary in China. You、Thank、went you. there for one year, and you're still there nine years later.、Oh, so that's that's, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> it's crazy. Even I can't. I lived it, and I can't believe it. <laughs> Where's the time gone? <laughs> I know, I know, it, but like so much has happened, you know. Like this past ten years has been like a crazy ten years. And you do have a video, and and I'll let you let you plug that video now too, Becky.、Um, I think it's called "How One Badminton Game Represents My Decade in China." That's coming soon. Yeah, it's it's not out yet, but I, I've already shot it and everything. I just have to. Final editing,、um, yeah, because I realized there's a badminton game on my YouTube channel.、Um, every couple months, I like to just put a video of me playing. It's not like so people can admire me because my games have not been so great recently. But it's just more for me, so I can see the progress of my games over time. And this video, I don't know why I love just this video. It's just a you know. Ten minute video of me and my friends playing, and I'm not playing very good, and nothing exciting happens, and it's just a normal night at club. But I kept watching this video like again and again and again, and I like put it on my phone because I can't access YouTube easily, so I I wanted it on my phone so I could watch it anytime. And I was like, "What is wrong with you? Like, why do you like this video so much of just a normal boring night?" <laughs> and then I realized. For everything to happen in that video, and for me to be in that place that I that I am now, to be in the place I am now, it took me ten years of like really challenging myself, some difficult times, some very embarrassing situations, and but ultimately being successful and ultimately like growing to the. To the woman that I didn't know I wanted to be, but <laughs> somewhere <laughs> deep inside I wanted to be, and like, you know, I, I'm still growing and still changing, but, but I'm definitely at like some rest stop, and I'm very like proud of how far I've come and and how much I've changed over the past ten years to to be the kind of person who has like my kind of life now, you know. It's、yeah. a little hard to explain. The video goes into it a bit more, but that's the basics. And I, I take it with with that video title, badminton was a big contributing factor in those ten years in China. Is that correct? Big contributing factor, yeah, super big. And and ultimately, it's kind of been the smallest part. I've only been playing badminton for a little more than four years, and I never played before that. So it's been the last part of that ten years. But yeah. Very important part to my life, obviously. 
Yeah, absolutely. And let's explore that for a moment, shall we? Because yeah. this is the badminton podcast, isn't it? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, tell us a bit about your badminton journey. What was it like? What was your first game of badminton like? And what what's been what's 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 your journey like? What what happened in between? What were some of the your biggest achievements? Your biggest failures? We want to know it all. Oh, well, you know, we don't have enough time to talk about all my failures, <laughs> but <laughs> my achievements, we can, we can talk about in 30 seconds, but my failures, we need like five hours. But <laughs> my first game, I actually don't remember my first game. I remember um, the very first time I played, my friends were very active and fun. I had this group of international friends that I met when I moved to Shaman five years ago. And every Tuesday, Thursday, they would play badminton. And they would invite me, but it was about an hour away from my house. And I didn't care about badminton or sports. (laughs) So (laughs) I always said no. And one night, it was one of my friend's birthday. And another friend made a surprise party after badminton. So I figured since I have to go to this surprise party, I might as well go to badminton beforehand. So I went, but, you know, I've tried to think about that night, but I cannot remember anything about the first time I played badminton. (laughs) (laughs) I know that I wore like khaki pants and a cotton shirt, like a polo shirt and some like New Balance sneakers. Like it took me weeks or probably months before I actually got like, a sports shirt (laughs) and some sports pants. I wore khakis for weeks and weeks and weeks to play badminton because I just didn't know, you know, I didn't know. I mean, I knew sports shirts existed in the world, but I didn't know like, where do you buy them? And like, why do you wear them? You know? So I don't remember why I started, but obviously I liked it. I definitely didn't like love badminton right in the beginning not that I consciously remember, but I must have had fun with my friends because I started going once a week and they were playing twice a week. I know um, we were playing, this place was very dingy. It was the fourth floor of a warehouse with like broken windows. And, you know, it was really, really a dingy place, cement floor with just like a very thin green pad, terrible lighting. And I asked my friends, Shaman is a, you know, subtropical city. It gets very, very, very hot and humid here. No air conditioning in badminton courts. And I started playing March and I asked my friends, uh, I bet like June, this place gets really hot, right? And they said, oh yeah, it's disgusting. And it smells bad. And it's so hot because they closed the windows (laughs) like to prevent the wind, you know, Mm -hmm. all the windows had these like big, ugly blue tarps in front of them. So there was no airflow at all. And I said, yeah, well, you know, I hate sweating. That was like very much my thing (laughs) was how much I hate sweating and how much I hate summer. And even now that's like my thing. And I said, well, obviously I'm going to stop. Like as soon as it gets hot, I'm stopping. But it started getting hot and it started getting smelly and I started sweating and I kept going. (laughs) And I asked myself, I literally asked myself, I said, why are you even going to badminton? Like it's hot (laughs) and sweaty. And I was like, why do I keep going? And then I was like, do I, wait, do I like badminton? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> because for me to like a sport was just so out of the realm of anything my conscious brain could think of that I was like, why am I like, I see my friends all the time. I'm not going for my friends. Like I see them three, four times a week outside of badminton. Yeah. I was like, I think I like badminton. <laughs> and then once that clicked and I was like, yeah, I like badminton. That was just like, boom, I am badminton. <laughs> <laughs> From that point on, I was just like badminton everything. <laughs> and and I got I didn't even get my first racket until like the end of June. My birthday is the end of June. And I didn't even get a racket. My friends got me a racket, my very first badminton racket. For months I had just been using the junky, like there was like a, a locker that had been used for years and years and it was a very junky racket. But like I didn't even think to get a racket, you know? Like I, I finally got a sports shirt but I didn't even think that you could get badminton stuff. Like I was so, you know, I'm sorry, I'm American. I was so naive. I had no idea. Like I didn't know you could go to a store and like buy badminton stuff, you know? So 
So it wasn't, it was, it took me about four months, but then once like that four months and I decided I liked badminton, I was like, this is what I want to do. So all in, all, all in, in. Totally. go hard or go home. Like badminton monster. <laughs> and you don't even like it anymore. You love it. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Crazy. <laughs> And I remember, um, also I remember the first time I quote unquote learned badminton, um, it was about that time. It was a little after my birthday and my friend, um, Xiaohe, he came to visit. Um, he was my friend outside of badminton, but he was the only person I knew that was really good because this foreigner group that I was playing with, um, they still play, um, twice a week, same days. They're, you know, basically beginners, so we were all just playing for fun. Like we were playing by the rules, but you know, we certainly weren't like diving and doing serious smashes and stuff. And my friend Xiao He came and he was, he was in Chinese, you say like Gaosho, like a top player in the city. Mm-hmm. And, um, he didn't want to play with us cause it'd be way too boring. So he said, why don't I teach you something? And I said, yeah, cool. Okay. And he said, why don't we just hit it? Like from the back of the court to the back of the court. I didn't know any badminton words at that time. Yeah. Like, I didn't know what a clear was. So he said, back of the court to the back of the court. And I said, oh yeah, no, I can't do that. I'm not strong enough. And he looked at me and he was like, Becky, little children can do this. <laughs> he was like, you don't need to be strong. You just have to have form. And I was like, what? <laughs> you know, like, what are you talking about? And he taught me that like very basic, like, you know, ER sign, like the one, two, three, like above your head, behind your back and forward. And immediately I could do a clear from the back of the court to the back of the court. And I was blown away that something as simple as like precise movements with my body could give me such an immediate improvement like in badminton. And then I actually said, I'm sorry, I'm so stupid, but I actually said, can you learn badminton? (laughs) (laughs) And my friend was like, is that a thing? Yeah. I was like, can you learn badminton? And my friend was like, yeah, you know, there are coaches. (laughs) Oh my God. And I was like, can you help me find a coach? (laughs) And my friend was like, sure. Yeah. And then, you know, within, within a couple months we had summer holiday and I went traveling, but after summer holiday, my friend, you know, found a coach and my coach for sure has like changed my life because we're like family now. So, you know, the beginning was just, you know, it's an incredibly embarrassing, like naive (laughs) story of like how to get started, but ultimately it worked out. (laughs) Yeah. Do you, do you get the coaching in Chinese? Yeah. 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 My coach doesn't speak That's, English. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Beyond a few words. And that was a really big worry for me. The very first time I met him, I was like, oh, can he understand me? Like, will I understand him? But, um, and his Chinese for the record is terrible. He's a real local guy. Yeah, <laughs> really. His Chinese is not like standard. It's very like local. Yeah, slang. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, cool. yeah. yeah. So, you know, I like to make fun of him for his terrible Chinese and then he makes fun of me for my terrible Chinese. So it's fun. <laughs> it's a good relationship to have, isn't it? Yeah. We have like a great relationship. It would have been the full, full Chinese experience for the badminton coaching for you. And totally. And it more than just badminton coaching, like he's, he is very much, uh, he, I don't know, like I'm older than him by a year, but we're basically the same age, but mm. he also, you know, cause we're so close and like, I don't have family in China or anything. So he's definitely taken the role of like Chinese family, you know, and he definitely, and, and he's had to teach me more than just badminton. He's had to teach me sports, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, because I didn't even know anything about sports. So like he had to teach me like, um, etiquette, you know, like yeah. I would hit the, hit the shuttle into the net and, and I would make the other team get it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like I'm not supposed to have to be a jerk, but it, it just like, you it's just your turn. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Your shuttle, like you get it, you know? And, and my coach <laughs> would be like, what are you doing? Like, you don't have any, you don't have any manners. And I was like, (laughs) what? You know? So he's really had to like teach me a lot of like sports culture, Chinese culture. He's had to teach me words, obviously. Um, Mm. 
all the badminton words. I, you know, yeah. not daily usage. So he's had to <laughs> teach me all that. So he's, he's really had to teach me a lot. And, and over the years, you know, he's really like, tries to take care of me if I need it. Like if anything's wrong, he's like, do you need money? Like, do you need me to get you? <laughs> you know, like, Whoa. <laughs> yeah, like he's just very like cares a lot about me. And I've been to his hometown, yeah. like I'm best friends with his wife and his kids and his mom. And, you know, so it's really, really an awesome relationship. Yeah. That's really nice. Isn't it? Uh, that, that badminton, badminton has brought that to your life. And yeah, that, that's fantastic. Totally. And it's like, you know, only because of badminton. I never would have, he can't speak English. He's not friends with foreigners, like none of that. So it's like 100. And this friendship I know will last my whole life, even if and when I move. But it's like all, all thanks to badminton, you know? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Totally. Now with, on the topic of foreigners, was it challenging at all being a foreigner and being, being Caucasian in China and learning the sport? Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, other than the language barrier, were there any, yeah, what was, what else was challenging? Um, well, starting in your forties maybe would have been a challenge as well, right? You would think. And I <laughs> kind of thought that, especially when I was playing with the foreigner group, um, it's a bit easy to use that a little bit as an excuse of like why you suck. <laughs> and you're like, Hey, <laughs> Hey man, I'm 40. You're 20. I'm 40. Like, yeah. <laughs> Like, you're meant to be better. <laughs> yeah, you're meant to, like if you're not better, then you suck so bad, you know. But <laughs> when I started really getting involved in badminton and I started having my own club, like, you know, this is like China. Like, there's like a ton of people in their 40s that don't just like play occasionally, like they're playing five, six times a week, you know, and they're mm. and and nobody here, like to be a pro player, um, you have to be chosen at, at quite a young age. So if you make it to college and you're not chosen by the national team, like you have no chance basically to be on the pro team. So everybody here from college age up is doing it like 100% for the love. And because my coach is so dedicated and passionate, um, his club that he started, he has his own badminton courts and badminton hall. Um, the people that go there are equally passionate and obsessed with badminton. So it was very much a a very convenient excuse until I got more into the badminton community and realized that I can't really use age as an excuse, but I can use being a foreigner as an excuse. (laughs) Um, But you've also gotten better since then as well, right? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And, and some things being a foreigner, um, I've definitely gotten some advantages, um, because everybody wants to play with a foreigner because most people never have, you know, especially like a white person and they think it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I've played some games and I've got like some really high level players who are willing to play with me, you know, for a game. They're not gonna take me under their wing or anything. Um, and there was a guy for a while, um, he's a coach and he was also coaching me one time I had three coaches (laughs) and this guy, he wanted to learn English. So what we would do is we would have about an hour of badminton training, um, in Chinese speaking Chinese, and then we would go have lunch and we would speak English for an hour. So like, that was a really good, uh, you know, advantage of being a foreigner, but there are a ton of disadvantages. Um, a lot of people are like scared of me, (laughs) like they will ignore me or just basically like not even look at me, you know, because they don't know if I can speak Chinese. They don't know like who I am or like what I'm doing. You know, there's no, there's no like, there's no like white guy who's playing badminton. So I'm not like his girlfriend, (laughs) you know, (laughs) (laughs) So they don't quite get what I'm doing and it's easier, you know, in general, Chinese society is a bit more shy and outgoing than especially American society. So, um, people, it's just easier to ignore me. And that was really hard in the beginning when I didn't know anybody, um, for the first couple of years, um, I trained with my coach for a year. He didn't have his badminton hall yet. So I would still play with the foreigner group and I would train once a week with my coach. But then once he opened up his courts, I would just go to his courts every day and play. And all of those people were strangers to me. And 
it took a really long time. A couple of them were friendly to me in the beginning, but very few. And it took me a really long time because also the language, I couldn't just like hang out and chat, you know, because even now, like when there's a bunch of people talking quickly, I have a hard time following. And back then I didn't even know them. So I was like nervous and strangers and all that. So that it took me a really, really long time to like feel comfortable. And it was in stark difference to the foreigner group. Um, the foreigner group, they were all my friends. We all spoke English. Um, you know, there was a boy in the foreigner group that I had started to have a crush on and then I, that I was, that I liked, but I wanted to improve badminton more than anything. So I just said <laughs> to myself, like, I got to ditch my friends because my friends are great. And I, they weren't, uh, I wasn't better than them at the point that I stopped playing with them, but I wanted to be better than all of them. So I knew that I would have to leave them and stop playing them just to make like my badminton playing better. And I knew that I would just have to deal with this uncomfortable group. And, and actually in a video that I have coming up as well, like I've always told myself, like, you're not here to make friends. You're here to play badminton. So (laughs) even if it's uncomfortable, like you play with whoever's the best people to play with, like, even if the social life is (laughs) miserable. So I find that so funny because for, I don't know about you, Jeff, but for me, the community and, and going there to catch up with friends has always been one of the reasons why I love the sport so much. Really? Since the, <laughs> since the beginning, even like when you started? Not when I started. So yeah, I, I think when I started, it was all about just trying to learn the sport and yeah. there was just so many ways to improve. And yeah. I guess that's probably, it's, it's that, that steep learning curve that we all enjoy. Well, I think most people enjoy a steep learning curve as long as totally. it's um, rewarding throughout you get some milestones like being able to clear from one side of the court yeah. to the other right yeah, so <laughs> yeah. but I, I take the, uh, the the positive you got from that was uh, was of course getting out of that warehouse the bottom floor of the warehouse is that correct yeah um <laughs> yeah that was nice to get out of the, that place and my coach you know of course his court is like a beautiful court that now I feel very comfortable and now it's been so many years of me just being everywhere. Like I don't just play at my coach's court. Like I play all over. If someone invites me, if someone good invites me, then I will go. Yeah. I will play with them wherever. So at this point, it's kind of like, I'm the only like Westerner that plays badminton constantly in shaman. So at this point, people like now they know me enough where a lot mm. now I go to a place and they're like, Hey, Shell Bing. And I'm like, hi, <laughs> hey. like, I don't remember them. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and they're like, Hey, yeah. Like we played together like two years ago. Do you remember? And I'm like, no, I'm sorry. I don't remember. Or, or I just go, yeah, I remember, <laughs> you know, we had um, a really good game. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. How are you? Good to see you again. You know, but That was hard. And also, um, foreigners can't enter every competition. Some competitions, you have to have a Chinese ID card. And yeah, I fought a lot of them. And my coach has fought a lot on my behalf. I do have a Chinese social security card for the city. So any competition that's kind of like a shaman city competition, I can get in on because of my social, uh, my social security card, Chinese social security card. Um, but there's a bunch, they just, I think it's like a, I think it's like an insurance thing. I think foreigners are more expensive to insure (laughs) and some competitions, they don't want to do that. And they actually, they do include Hong Kong and Taiwan in, in the, um, quote unquote foreigners, you know, I don't want to get political. Yeah, right. Okay. They do. Yeah, let's, let's not, let's not delve yeah. into that. But, but this they moment do say in time. Like, like no foreigners, <laughs> no Hong Kong, no Taiwan. And my boyfriend is Taiwanese. So the good thing about it is when I can't play, he can't play also. So it does make me feel good <laughs> that someone else is being left out. <laughs> okay. I well, think we need to explore this. Sorry. Sorry, Becky, yeah. to cut you off. You have a boyfriend from, yeah. from Taiwan. Yeah. Tell us about this multicultural romance of yours. Um, well, I met him with badminton. <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> I can't do anything. I mean, I would never date a guy that doesn't play badminton. Doesn't play. <laughs> I would never see him, right? He could watch me play badminton, but I'd never see him. Um, we met, he was in the foreigner group when I started playing. I also don't have a first memory of him. He's kind of a shy, quiet guy. 
And in that group, um, there is a bunch of Taiwanese players and they were kind of the best players. So they would tend to play like with themselves. And there are some Filipino players that were really good. And I was a total beginner. I didn't dare play with them, even though they were very, very nice. Um, and I don't know, you know, time, time went by and sometimes we ended up playing together, but I didn't, I didn't really know him. Like we didn't really talk to each other that much. I don't remember how we started talking, but slowly, I think I had like met my coach and I was speaking a lot more Chinese. And so I was talking with him a lot more because, you know, he doesn't speak English. And somehow we would play badminton and he was the best in the foreigner group. He was the best player. And the thing I really liked about him, because I've always been um, annoying. <laughs> like, <laughs> I've always been very pushy, like, I want to go for the shuttle, you know, even if I shouldn't necessarily. And in the beginning, I thought everything was mine, you know, and I had no patience. So I would always go for the shuttle and he would go for the shuttle, but he would like, let me try. And if I missed it, then he would just be behind me and get it. So he was always a really good partner because he never gave me pressure. He never made me feel bad but he was like very reliable partner. And then as I kind of like got to know him, I realized that was like his personality. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, just a very, like whatever, whatever, whenever we made plans, you know how sometimes people you're like, Hey, let's have dinner like two weeks on a Friday. And they're like, yeah, I'll let you know. And, and they kind of wait until like to see if something cooler is happening. And if it's not, they'll go. He would always just be like, okay. And he would be there, you know, like he would never back out of anything. He'd never change plans. He was just very reliable. And then I realized like his badminton playing and the way he was on badminton court, like does translate really well to like a boyfriend, <laughs> you know? someone who's just like there for you when you need them. But I'm very, you know, I'm very motivated and I'm, you know, very talkative, obviously. So he compliments my personality in that oppositeness, you know, but he's so reliable. And, uh, <laughs> and then, you know, we got to know each other with badminton and then we started hanging out after badminton. And, um, I ended up telling him on uh, Christmas Eve that I liked him and did he like me? <laughs> and Aww. it took him a while to respond because he thought I was joking because, you know, in China, it's like, like, uh, Western women, Asian men are not such a common pairing. You know, it's usually like a Western man and an Asian woman. Mm. So he thought, you know, a lot of people think it's a, it's a, it's a bad stereotype that like Western women only want, you know, rich guys or good looking guys like Chinese guys. And he's just a common guy, you know? So he kind of, he, he did think that I, he was, I was joking that, you know, I was going to say, I like you. Do you like me? And, and he would say, yeah, I like you. And I'd laugh at him or something. So he finally said like, yeah, I mean, I guess I like you. <laughs> and, <laughs> and our first date was we played badminton. You know, we were playing badminton. It was on of Christmas course. Day. Yeah. And <laughs> we went out to dinner after badminton and he gave me a racket that day. He gave me his racket, his badminton racket. So uh -huh. nice yeah, you know, it was a match made in badminton. And now I'm the one who's like dragging him. He, so he plays badminton the most. He plays about four days a week, but, um, he doesn't care about competitions as much as I do. And he's not like as competitive, but I'm dragging him everywhere. <laughs> like he's kind of like my, uh, built in partner. Like if I can't find someone to play with me, he'll agree to play in a competition like mixed doubles. So mm -hmm. I've dragged the poor guy everywhere to play competitions and you know, he likes it. He likes it. <laughs> <laughs> Are you speaking for him or is that, does he say that too? Um, I'm sure he'd say it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he doesn't hate it. You know, he does play badminton on his own four days a week. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, you know, that's all thanks to badminton too. I know my life is crazy with badminton. Yeah, I was, uh, one of the questions that we were thinking of asking you, Becky, was what impact has badminton had on your life? But 
you basically answered it all because everything yeah. has, a has had just, every, a little. Every, just a little bit of an impact where just you were so excited you got bit. you got a present uh racket as a present and that <laughs> yeah no like i know i know maybe it's pathetic but no not at all just got you know you guys understand you understand we, we, we understand completely <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> But um, there, there was a point where you where you said, you know, you, you realized that you liked badminton, right? And then yeah. you had all these challenges to, to overcome, to become a badminton player in China. But there must have been something about the sport that maybe you know now that just drew you in and just kept you playing. Is, is there anything about the sport particularly that, that really drove you, or motivated you to, to improve and get better? I'm actually not sure. Like I've tried to answer this myself. Like, why do I love badminton? And I don't have such a good answer. I've always been a competitive person, but I mean, obviously like there's a ton of sports and I was never into sports. So like, it's not that I just never tried a sport and badminton was the first sport I tried. It's not that at all. You know, I grew up in America. I played baseball. I was on the track team. Like I did sports, but I never liked them. And I was never good at them. And I don't know. I think um, some basic stuff. I, I obviously I don't like. I don't want to play a contact sport. You know, I don't want to break my hip or anything. I think I like. I hate running. <laughs> I still hate running. <laughs> so it's nice that badminton um, short bursts. You know that you don't have to do distance. I don't like distance running. Um, but I really don't know what it is specifically about badminton, but whatever, whatever box it ticks, like badminton ticks all the boxes, but I, I don't know. Like I was never looking for something like that. I was never desiring, like, the, it's not like I really love like nets or green <laughs> floors. Or, you know, like, there's nothing aesthetic about badminton that I've ever particularly liked like now I love you know everything aesthetic about badminton but I don't know I don't have a good answer I don't know what it is I don't know what it is that I like so much about badminton just love it it's okay we'll keep asking questions and maybe you'll figure it out or maybe one day during your v your vlogs you'll you'll all of a sudden um you know get get a moment a spark and and you'll know exactly why you love the sport that would be awesome I would love that or maybe it's just one of life's mysteries. Yeah, I think that's what it's probably going to be. <laughs> <laughs> now, Becky, this whole experience that you've had moving from the States, being in China for 10 years, playing badminton now religiously, what do you think that the whole experience has taught you? What, what have you learned about yourself during this whole process, would you say? If I was going to say the top three things you've learned. Um... Well, okay. There is a bit of, um, it's not exactly clear cut, right? Because I am in China. Um, and even though I was already in China and even though I could already speak Chinese, um, badminton is wrapped up in speaking Chinese, learning the culture, like having friends. So I can't quite separate it, but I do think things like grit, perseverance, you know, like not that I, not that I thought I was someone that gave up on things, but I've never, you know, like with my quote unquote career, like I've never really had a career. I've never really cared to have a career. I'm happy to make enough money to live and then just do like what I want to do. And that's like, to me, like a very successful person, <laughs> you know, like even though I'm not rich, I'm very poor, but my life is 80% of what I want to do. You know, my job is, I, I really like my job, but the best part is I get a ton of holidays and I work very <laughs> little every week. I only work 12 hours a week. So wow. yeah, I only have six classes, which is common for college in China. So it's not that I thought I was someone that gave up, but I've never had something that I've wanted so badly and something that I've been willing to like humiliate myself and embarrass myself and continually fail and continually lose, but that I didn't stop. And I never, oh, I can't say never. There was one night, there was one night where I was like, why am I playing badminton? This is stupid. You know, one dark night. <laughs> and it was because some, some people were mean to me, but this was like oh. in my, in my first year before 
right when I had just met my coach. So it was very early stages, but even after that, and it got much tougher after I met my coach and after I met my club, because it was just humiliating because everybody was so much better than me. You know, everybody my age, like people in their forties, they've been playing for 20 years, you know? So people in their forties were so good. Even the recreational players had just been playing for so long. They had so much knowledge. They were just so much better than me because I had just started. And I guess, I guess what I really learned about myself is that I can like get through the embarrassment and I can just handle it. And I know now I know that in the end I can, I can do it, you know, like I just have to stick with it. I guess what's that stick to itness or whatever. Perseverance. <laughs> Perseverance, like grit. Like, I guess yeah. that's the thing I've learned the most that, cause I have no natural ability. Like my body, my body is like, my heritage is like Eastern European, like farmers, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> I would be really good. I think at like wrestling or like shot put, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> something where you need like a big bulky body. Like that's my body type, which is not at all appropriate for badminton. And, you know, I'm not a fast thinker. I'm not a strategic thinker. Like you can tell me something a hundred times and I'm going to forget it a hundred and two times. And, but I just like kept, I just kept at it. And, and even though like if somebody else did exactly what I did, they would be a hundred levels better than me at this point, <laughs> but I'm still happy that like I am where I am, you know, that I, that I did do it. So I think that's the biggest lesson I've learned about myself is that if I just stick to it, if I really want it, like, you know, like I can do it. Absolutely. Maybe just one reason. <laughs> you know? We'll just give you yeah, just, just one reason for yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's yeah. the biggest, I think that's the biggest thing I learned, but also like, I, I think like learning Chinese has also been mixed into that because I'm not a natural Chinese language learner and I really do have to credit badminton. I was fluent before badminton, but I was never, um, really good or really confident. And, but because the badminton world is all Chinese and I want to be in the badminton world, like I just had to become more confident speaking Chinese and talking to strangers and, you know, getting into it. So that also like taught me just, just, just do it. You know, like, even if you sound stupid, even if you look stupid, like just do it. And you know, it works. Everybody laughs at my Chinese, but I don't care. You know, I'm not proud of my Chinese. So I don't care. And they still understand what you're saying. So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. That's the yeah. most important thing. Exactly. So, we actually have a very common opinion on something which Jeff and I are very passionate about, as you might expect. And the question we were going to ask, and the question I want to ask is what, what do you think of conventional badminton clothing? Well, you know what I think about conventional <laughs> badminton clothing. <laughs> it is so ugly. <laughs> so ugly. I cannot stand badminton clothes. And I don't know why, like, why isn't everybody outraged? <laughs> like, <laughs> like pinks and stripes and just the like splattered patterns and God, it's just so ugly. Um, and you know, like my personal fashion sense is atrocious. Like I don't have fashion sense, but I also don't wear like multi neon colored clothes <laughs> with flashes and like you know, <laughs> patterns. And it's just so hideous. And like with my club, you know, cause yeah, everybody knows that I like black clothes. Like I, I always like to wear black shirts and I'll just wear sports shirts. I, I rarely wear badminton shirts because they're so ugly. And my club, we were making new shirts and, uh, my coach was putting up some samples and different patterns and different colors. And, you know, and everyone was like, Oh, uh -uh, like Xiaobing, like my Chinese name. They were like, Xiaobing won't like those. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I was getting this big fight. And I'm like, can we just get like one color? Okay. Like choose a bright <laughs> color, but can we just have one color and not like a crisscross pattern and not yeah. like weird shoulder slash and, <laughs> oh my God. It just drives me nuts how ugly badminton clothes is. And, and I have a friend who works at Decathlon and I like Decathlon's clothes. I, I buy their yoga clothes a lot because they're just black mm. shirts. Mm. 
And I'm like, you know, she's in the management, but I'm like, can you, can you put me on the phone with whoever is in charge of designing badminton clothes? for <laughs> <laughs> Because I love the Decathlon brand, but they're like our tango brand, which is their badminton brand. Like their shirts are just hideous, just mm. hideous. And I want to buy Decathlon clothes, like they're good size and good quality, but, oh, I can't do it. It's so ugly. <laughs> you know, okay. I, <laughs> Two things. Well, okay, this podcast is over. Proudly sponsored by Volant Wear, the most uh, versatile badminton apparel in the world. And and two, um, Becky, would you like a t-shirt when we make women's t-shirts? <laughs> yeah, I would. <laughs> <laughs> this, this podcast is not over. I just I just thought I'd plug that in there. <laughs> I, yeah, I would. As long as it's you know one color. I mean, I like the men's stuff you have is nice and simple. I don't know. Be, like, we won't I'm, be changing our style. <laughs> I'm glad like, because I, I kind of feel like it's kind of like being gaslit, right? Like everybody does it and everybody wears it and nobody ever talks about how ugly it is. So I feel like <laughs> am I the only one? So I'm actually really glad like when you guys originally c- contacted me and you're like, we agree. And I was like, yes, <laughs> like it's not me. <laughs> you're not alone. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, you know. I wish you all the success in the world because we need more people like you making badminton clothes. <laughs> <laughs> now, Becky, if we can start, um, we can, if we can close up just with a few other questions, actually, it's only mainly just two questions. Sure. The first question being, if someone was to do something similar to you, whether it be move to China or move to any other country to play badminton, what piece of advice would you actually tell them that would help them in that journey? Um, specifically moving to China, I would say um, they just have to put themselves out there. That mm. even though it feels embarrassing and even though, you know, often, like I'm the guest, you know, like I'm the shy one, I'm the visitor and they're kind of more confident. It's like you have to push, you kind of have to push your way in because it, like I said before, it's pretty easy to be ignored. And um, obviously, if you're a really, really good player, you'll get noticed. But even that takes some time. There is an um, Indonesian kid here who's really good, but it took it took about a year before like the top players like noticed him, you know, and invited him to play with him. So I think the the most important thing would just to force yourself to be very outgoing and maybe it feels a little pushy at times, but don't feel bad about being pushy and trying to play with people, you know, just keep doing it. Yeah. I think that's great advice. Just, you just have to get out there and do it, don't you? And if you do it repeatedly, then what will happen is people will get more and more used to, and then all of a sudden you just become that really enthusiastic people that everyone actually wants to play with and everyone wants to talk to. It's just got to start from somewhere and that initial level of being uncomfortable is just something you need to work through in order to to get to where you want to be. Totally. And I don't mean like be rude and be like, I'm playing now, you know, like, (laughs) but it's like, you know, when, when there's that awkward moment where there's like three people and there's one missing person and they're about to call their friend, but their friend's not really paying attention. You could be like, Hey, I'll play, you know, and run in (laughs) and that's fine. And you know, like, like, so don't be rude about it, but, but push a bit, push, push a, a bit in. And then at some point you'll be comfortable, but it, it will take a while. So, and everyone knows that exact moment when there's three players on court and everyone <laughs> sort of one step forward, one step back. Totally. Not sure. <laughs> totally. Like at that moment, you just got to take the reins and you just got to like, you know, be like, I'm doing it. <laughs> I'm in, I'm in, <laughs> I'm in, I'm in my game. <laughs> Now, Becky, if um, someone listening would like to watch your YouTube clips or read your blogs, how would they get to do that? And how would they actually make contact with you if they wanted to have a chat? Um, Well, you know, my YouTube channel is called Badminton Becky. I'm the only Badminton Becky, so it's easy to find. Mm -hmm. And, you know, definitely please subscribe and like everything. Um, Just because I think you guys know, like, I really like you guys. I know you believe this too. Um, There's not enough badminton content in the world and badminton needs to for sure get out to a bigger audience because there's people like me who 
maybe not as obsessed as me, but there's people like me who just have <laughs> no, no access or knowledge about badminton. And if they had just a little, they might get interested in it, you know? So, um, on YouTube, if you subscribe to a channel and if you watch their content and for YouTube, watching it is very important. So, um, you know, t- for people listening to support badminton on YouTube, you should watch a video and then like the whole video, don't just start it and then stop it. Um, you could, you could mute it. You could walk away, whatever. I'm not saying you have to watch everything I say, but, um, YouTube will then assume it's an algorithm. It'll assume that it's very interesting and it'll start recommending it to people and it will start recommending it to people who don't necessarily watch badminton, but maybe there's a keyword or something like someone who's interested in China. Like they might find my videos because China's in the title a lot. So we really need people who already love badminton. We really need them to support badminton content on the internet. And they, and with all the algorithms and stuff, it really is about subscribers and likes and watch times. So people do need to watch stuff to get it to spread to people who maybe wouldn't necessarily see the content in the first place. So, so that was a long answer, but badminton Becky, (laughs) (laughs) please subscribe. And, um, I'm on Facebook. I have a Facebook page, Badminton Becky. Um, I'm badmintonbecky.com on the internet. And I'm also Becky Ansis, A-N-C-E-S. It's all one word, dot net. Um, That's my personal website about life in China. And that's one that I started 11 years ago before I moved to China. And, And that one, I know, especially my American friends, they don't care so much about badminton. So I try to keep that one about China, teaching English, traveling, and the badmintonbecky.com and the YouTube channel as, uh, you know, all badminton content. Um, but, uh, a lot of people contact me on Facebook. You could just like on badminton Becky Facebook page, you could just write to me. Um, huh. I always write back, you know, so she does, okay. she does test to that. I swear. I mean, cause I'm just so like, because I just love badminton and a lot of my friends, like even in China and in America, like they're just tired of me talking about badminton. <laughs> <laughs> like I started the vlog and my YouTube channel just so I could talk about badminton <laughs> and <laughs> knowing that the people who are going to watch are not going to be like, Oh my God, shut up about badminton already. Like people who watch a badminton video are interested in badminton. I mean, so absolutely. it's like, that's why. So I love talking to people about badminton. And even though, you know, a lot of people have different ideas and we all have different experiences. And I really like how, how our game is the same, but in every country, it's so different, like how it's actualized, you know, how clubs work, how groups work, you know, even the cost of shuttles, you know, like I know in a lot of countries, like maybe Australia, like shuttles is such a big issue because they're expensive, you know, <laughs> and like you can like lose friendships over like some jerk that never brings shuttles, but always <laughs> uses everybody else's, you know, <laughs> like stuff like that. It never happens in China, like, yep. you know we got shuttles feather, of course, feather, like falling from the sky here. So I really like hearing everybody's experiences and, and I really like, you know, believe it or not, Americans have written to me. There are some Americans that play badminton. (laughs) (laughs) I really like hearing from them just to, just to hear their experiences of different parts of America. So, Mm. yeah. So please, everyone can feel free to write to me anytime to talk about badminton. Becky, thanks so much for being on the podcast today. Thank you so much for asking me. Super fun. You know, we got to talk about badminton. So I know. I, I think what we usually do at the end of the podcast is we just usually take some key takeaways from the podcast episode. And I think mine is just, <laughs> I'm still just really, I don't know the word, right, right word for it, actually. I'm just blown away. That's the right word. I'm just blown away by how much badminton has actually changed your life, whether it be socially and in your relationships, your friendships and learning a new language and you being there for nine more years than you're planning to be. <laughs> I think it's just huge in in what you can actually do in badminton and what kind of bonds and friends you can form. So I think that's really cool. Yeah, well, cool. Thank you. That's nice. And for me, 
what I can really get out of this podcast is I could really feel the energy that Becky has brought just, just when like the second you started talking about badminton, it, 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 it amazed me. Like I could just feel it through. I, I can't, I can't describe it. It was just, it's, it's incredible. Like this in the entire podcast for me, it was just it was so enjoyable to see how much badminton has changed you and what it's taught you about, um, I think the word, I don't know. I don't know if this is the word that you were looking for earlier. Tenacity, um, but your good resolve, word, to, yeah, <laughs> your resolve to become becoming a better badminton player is something that uh, the audience can take away, regardless of whether they they consider it for badminton or any other sport or even their professional personal lives um, to persevere in, in for those things that they really want to do, really want to achieve. So thank you for sharing that energy and your passion for the sport Becky well like thanks thanks for saying that that was really really nice you know most people just call me crazy so (laughs) it's it's nice to hear that so thank you so for everyone out there listening thanks so much for tuning into the badminton podcast it was awesome today I'd love to I'd love to have more people like Becky on who are really enthused and really passionate about badminton so that they can share their stories and what they've done with the sport as well But in the meantime, make sure you keep sharing your love for the sport with everyone you know and you share this podcast to everyone just because I know that there's going to be lots of useful information that you're going to get out of it that you can start applying in your lives. And I think you'll resonate with a lot of the stories that the people tell. So make sure you let everyone know about that. And if you want to connect with us, you can connect with us via our social media handle, Volantware, V-O-L-A-N-T-W-E-A-R, on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, as well as on our website, www.volantware.com. Thanks, guys. Bye. 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 (laughs) (laughs) This podcast was brought to you by Volantware, the most versatile badminton apparel you'll ever own.